الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد One of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes is Al-Wasi' What does Al-Wasi' mean? When you look at the translations of the Qur'an where this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is used, they try to explain it, this is why I got this Qur'an, this is the Noble Qur'an. And Ayah number 73 of Surah Ali Imran has this word, Wallahu wasi'un alim. And it has been translated as all sufficient. The reason I mention this, you look at some other translations, will be similar meanings. But in reality, wasi' is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that by itself is so vast that it's difficult to have put any limit <laughs> to this attribute. The word wasi' itself means the thing that has no limits to it. Wusat is used in Urdu language also. Which means something is too big, is very wide. And of course, depending on what that thing is, accordingly the word wusa in Arabic and wusat in Urdu will be used for it. Some people in the translation would put that limit that he's all-knowing. He encompasses everything through his knowledge. But in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not limited to just knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no limits to any of his attributes. So you take any of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this wasi' will apply to that attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Rabb and there is no limit to being Rabb. His Rabb to what extent? For who? There is no limit to that. So it's wasi' It's all white. You can just keep on going on and on and on. And there is no end to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahim. To what limit? We cannot put those limits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's wasi. There is vastness in there. And it continues. You go to a certain extent, our mind will stop functioning. That how can you go beyond this? But still his rahmah goes beyond that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is khaliq. To what extent, to what limit? We can just keep on thinking about it. And normally, we think about things that are around us in the world. Then finally, a human being feels very proud to look at the heavens above him and feel that I can even see the stars. But what's beyond that? What's beyond there and what's around us? What's underneath this world, this earth? This earth, we know that it's a globe. It's uh, something that is hanging in the air. There are no pillars down beneath it. There is something down there. How far does it go? It's all wus'a, which means it's all wasness. There is no end to it. Our mind stops functioning, gives up, gets tired to think about it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wus'a and wasness does not end in his khaliq, in every attribute as I said. So this wasa is such an attribute that will apply to all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is ghafoor. To what extent? There is no limit to it. He forgives and he keeps on forgiving and we cannot put any limit to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, is kareem. He gives to what extent there is no end to his karam and he is the owner, he is the king. To what extent? What does he own? Where does his kingdom end? We cannot put any limits to that. So this wasi' by itself, the attribute by itself is so vast that after a short thinking, we will give up. And this attribute will not end because it's an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, to find one word that I would explain al-wasi' in the English language may be difficult. And this is why when we look at the translations of the Qur'an, really you can never capture this meaning of al-wasi' from the translations. You can never understand 
this the vastness of the wasa itself by looking at the translations and of course i reminded this couple of times before and maybe good time to remind once again that normally when we try to understand things through the translation we need to realize that these translations are very limited they have a lot of limitations to them and especially with these type of words the reason is sometime the language itself is limited cannot take the other language the whole message of the other language in one word so the language itself is not is limited and does not have any wusa in it any vastness in it to accommodate other languages in it sometimes the translator his choice of the words may be limited and sometimes which goes even beyond this as translations translators understanding of the word may be very limited and it's a fact that if you look at it that you pick up the translations of quran especially in english language and you would realize that most of the translations are done by those who were not even familiar properly with the arabic language so they were trying to get help from other languages and from dictionaries to translate the quran most of the translations that we have in english language this is the situation with them that most of the translators they did not even know the proper language of the quran so they were taking the help of the normal dictionaries remember they were taking the help from dictionaries to translate quran so when a person will look for a translation of a meaning in a normal dictionary of a language so then this person does not for sure does not know the real tafsir of the word the real explanation of the word as it was explained by rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and sahaba ridwanullah alayhim ajma'in so if a person is not even too familiar with the language now there is no even need to go into talking about can we call that person mufassir after he translated the quran so most of the translators of course and even those who may had some knowledge of it they were not mufassirin they were not people who specialized in the tafsir and the understanding of the quran and this is not just with translation of quran majority of the of course is a fact that you see it with normally all the translations of the quran in this language but even be, beyond this you would see that people who translated books of hadith if you talk to that person about a hadith you may think that now this person is a big muhaddis because he translated a book of hadith he translated bukhari translated muslim you talk to the person about hadith after talking to that person about the meanings of some of the hadith that he has translated in his own book you may not even want to read that book anymore but most of these people we don't even know their backgrounds we don't know who they are we just know their names because it's printed on the books many people translate books of fiqh you talk to the person about issues of the sharia rulings of the sharia he has no clue of it he just got the help of the translations of the dictionaries he learned the language and he translated the book so this is something where we have to be very careful with it that who is translating it does the translator has any background of this field or he's just taking it word by word or he's just trying to put three four books in front of him and then try to get the gist of it and explain it according to his own understanding of it what's the background of the person so this is another reason why many times we don't get the right understanding from the translations whether it's quran or hadith of books of fiqh or any other books of sharia because the translator himself doesn't know what this thing is all about all he wanted to do is a person wanted to do some kind of work of deen and he thought he should put his effort in translating some of these things either quran or a book of hadith or a book of fiqh or something like this and of course inshallah he will be rewarded according to his effort if he knew what he was doing but 
it will be limited according to his knowledge and according to his understanding and, and because of not being his field. So, here this word, wasa, really leads us to that understanding again that you don't find the right understanding of it through the translations and uh, a lot of with normally this is with most most of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and many other things as many times we talked about different examples of it in different ayahs of al quran al Karim. <coughs> so anyway Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wasa which means there is no limit to any of his attributes there is no end to them no one can put any end to any of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his power, his qudra. Where does it end? It does not end. So none of the things of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ever end. And this is why we find a hadith. Maybe now a good time to understand that hadith, which is in Sahih al-Bukhari and some other books of a hadith. And sometimes people read the hadith and they are not able to really get the meaning of the hadith, the real understanding of it, uh, the hadith says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there was a person who saw another person who used to commit a lot of sins. So he took an oath that I swear by God, Allah will not forgive this person. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, both of them died. So this person who took that oath, that Allah will not forgive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him and he said, who was the person taking oath that I will not forgive? You are a person who would take an oath that I will not forgive and he would, the, uh, uh, the order will be given to the angels, take him to Jahannam. Why? This person is limiting the maghfir of Allah. He does not have Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being al wasa That there is no limit to it. You see a person committing these many sins and now we can say, okay, if you have committed these many, then there is no forgiveness for you. There is nothing like this. We cannot put no end to these attributes, no limits to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes are endless. So, this is what al wasa means. That something that has no end to it. And subhanAllah, you look at now when from this angle you start studying the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I said, this attribute by itself is so vast that there is no end to it and there is no end to understanding it. But just some examples so that we can start thinking about it as we look at the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a razzaq and then his wusa in being a razzaq we see that the whole world everything that is created has to be nourished in one way or other in other words when you look at the whole world it looks like it's a huge dining table and everyone is eating from it how many creatures are eating how many people are eating how many living beings are getting their nourishment from this dining table? Uncountable for us. Of course, not for Allah, but for us, it's uncountable. Everyone is getting it. And getting it not only today. They were getting it yesterday, they are getting it today, they will be getting it tomorrow, and it's going on for, wallahu alam, how many millions of years. Now, is the risk being reduced at all throughout this time that okay so many people used it now there is no more sustenance for people this dining table now you see that something or not the whole thing just one of the corners is missing something now because so many people ate from this corner there's nothing like this the whole world is just getting it and getting it and getting it and it's still as full as it was in the beginning it's not being reduced. It says in the books of Tafasir, when Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wasalam went to Al-Khidr alayhi salatu wasalam, and then both of them have different type of knowledge. 
Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu wassalam is the most knowledgeable person regarding the Sharia, rules of deen. No one can be more knowledgeable of Sharia than a Prophet of Allah at his time. Musa alayhi salatu wassalam is the most knowledgeable person in, his, in the Sharia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him that there is a person who has different type of knowledge. The knowledge of things that are hidden from the views of human being. The knowledge, some knowledge of the ilm of ghaib, hidden ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that normally others don't know. Musa alayhi salatu was salam wanted to learn that knowledge also. So he went to al-Khidr alayhi salatu was salam. And we see three examples of the knowledge of al-Khidr alayhi salam in Quran without going into the details of them. At that time, imagine now two people, they are the highest in their knowledge, in their fields. And both of them are getting the knowledge directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there can't be any knowledge higher than the knowledge of these two people now. A bird came, small bird came and took some water from the ocean. How much it may have drank from the ocean? Maybe a drop, a couple of drops. Al-Khidr alayhi salatu wassalam says to Musa alayhi salatu wassalam that do you realize that with all the knowledge that you have and all the knowledge that I have, this is not even this much, as much as this uh, bird took the water from the ocean, this is not even this much in comparing to the ocean. So our knowledge is not even this much in comparing to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really that was only an example. Otherwise, even this is too much. That example is, the person is trying to exaggerate with the example. Because comparing to the ocean, two, three drops are still maybe some, something there. But the knowledge of human beings comparing to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again and again reminds us of the vastness of his knowledge, that he has the knowledge of all things, he has qudra over everything, wasi'a kursiyuhu samawati wal ard, his power is over everything. So there is no end to it. And as I said, you just keep on thinking about and try to put an end, how far should we go? There will be an end to our thinking, but no end to these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then one of the beautiful things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Quran, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ My mercy, my rahmah encompasses everything. It reminds me, reading in one of the books, uh, a scholar says that he saw Shaitan in his dream. Hmm. Shaitan came to debate with him in his dream. So he says to him, Do you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah encompasses everything? Rahmati wasi'at kulla shay? This is what Allah says. He says, Yes. He says, I'm something or I'm nothing. You are something, shay. You are something. He says, Then I'm going to get the rahmah too. وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ So I must get the rahmah. And you people believe that I will be punished forever. What happened to that rahmah now? So he says to him, he says, I told him that yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah encompasses everything and covers everything. But when someone does not accept it, someone rejects it, then of course he is the one who is refusing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah is there for you. Go ahead, do the sujood now. If a kafir today comes and tells us, how about the rahmah for me in the akhirah? It's there. Just say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu. It's there for you. It's only the person is rejecting it. He's saying, I don't want it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take it. It's for you. And he says, no, I don't want it. So you are rejecting it, the, the shaitan, he's told the shaitan that you are rejecting it. Allah is not keeping it away from you. 
Allah has it there for you. And it's there for you, for people who maybe, who can get worse than you, it's for everyone there. But whoever is willing to take it, they will get it. And a people, the people who would reject that, then of course, it's their own fault. So this is wasa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a wasa. And as I said, now instead of going into the depth of it, applying this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to anything, anything comes to your mind that Allah can do this, Allah will do this, this is the attribute of Allah, and you apply this there, and you just keep on going there. So we don't need to really go into the details of more examples. This is enough to understand al wasa subhanahu wa ta'ala and how nothing, nothing that is attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has any limits to it, has no end to it. The next attribute that is mentioned in this hadith is Al-Hakim subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are such that if you start talking about them, you'll just keep on talking and talking because they have no end to it, they have no limit to it. And Al-Hakim especially is a word that is being used a lot in Qur'an, being used a lot. The word Hikmah is being used a lot nowadays also in our common talks. And especially when a talk about Deen is there, we like to use the word Hikmah, that you use the Hikmah in talking about Deen and conveying the message of Deen. So this is why, without going into too much detail, I just like to bring up few points very briefly about this Al-Hakim subhanahu wa ta'ala and what does the word Hikmah mean. Literally, the word Hikmah is driven from the word Hakm. And Hakm in Arabic language means to stop something. Mana, to stop something. This is Hakm. <coughs> and then from the same word, hakam, the word hakam with the fatha uh, on the kaf has been driven, which means a judge, hakam. Why the hakam is called, uh, judge is called hakam? Because he stops people from doing wrong to each other by giving the right judgment. Hikmah is driven from the same word, hakam, which means to stop. And the reason is, hikmah will stop the person from doing wrong. This is why it's called hikmah. So this is the root word of the hikmah, is hakam, and really the, the literal meaning of hakam is to stop something. And then the word hikmah and hakam and hakim, all of them are driven from the same root word. What does hikmah mean? Hikmah means two things in Arabic language. One is to do something very perfectly. Hakama yahkamu, to do something perfectly. In such a perfect way that there is no better way of doing it. Of course, for a human being we say, Hakam al-amal, istahkam al-amal. He made it very, or istahkam al-bunyan. The building is mustahkam, which means very strong and perfect. Of course, that will be according to our understanding and according to our limitations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hakam and hakim in that sense, which means whatever He made, He made it perfect in what it should be. So, everything is perfect according to its creation and according to what it should be for the purposes that it is supposed to fulfill. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Qur'an al-Kareem, سُنْعَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَتْقَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ It is the creation of Allah who perfected everything that He made. أَتْقَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ He perfected everything. So, اتقان, which and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a believer who whenever he does something, يُتْقِنَهُ He does it perfectly. That when you do something, you don't do it half-heartedly. You do it properly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves people who when they do something, they get into it, they do it properly. This is one meaning of hakam, and when we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, hakim, as He has perfected everything that He created. The second meaning 
which is more commonly used is wisdom, understanding. What does in reality hikmah means when it comes to that sense? It means to have the best knowledge from the best sources and be able to use that knowledge in the best form. Three things. Have the best knowledge regarding something, whatever that is. Have the best knowledge of it from the best sources. And being able to use it in the best form. This is hikmah. Hikmah, if a human being gets it, is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran al-Kareem about Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salatu wa salam wa atainahu al-hikmah We gave him the hikmah which means the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people. And similar word has been used for Luqman in Quran al-Kareem who is known as Luqman al-Hakim Luqman the wise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the ayahs tells us very clearly about this hikmah, the rule of the hikmah. يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ he, he gives the hikmah to whomever he likes. Which means the gift. يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ He gives the hikmah to whomever he likes. وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Whoever is given hikmah, he has been blessed with a lot of blessings, a lot of good. Khair and kathira. Not only just khair, Allah says that hikmah is khair and kathira. That you have a lot of good now. Because this hikmah will apply in everything in your life. So from everything, everything that you do in your life is as per the hikmah. It's not as per emotions. It's as per hikmah. So everything, you are driving a lot of khair from this one hikmah. And then when we look at the hadith, we find that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that when a person humbles himself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors of hikmah for this person. In one of the hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a person who would perform salah with the jama'ah, for 40 days, continuously, each and every salah with jama'ah, for 40 days. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless that person with the hikmah. This is to open the door of the hikmah for our souls, to receive that special gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of hikmah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that perform salah with jama'ah for 40 days. Every salah for 40 days with the jama'ah. And Allah will open that door of the hikmah for you. And then of course, people will advance in it according to their abilities and according to uh, their zeal of learning and connecting themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, رأس الحكمة مخافة الله The peak of the hikmah, the highest level of the hikmah is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we look at these few ahadiths, we can see that the real hikmah may be a little different than what we normally understand the hikmah to be. For us, hikmah may be that he really invested his money in such a way that he was able to make a lot of profit out of it. He is very hakim, he has a lot of hikmah. But it looks from the ahadith that the real hikmah is something different. The real wisdom is something different than what the normal understanding of the wisdom is. So, hikmah is really to get to the highest type of knowledge from the highest sources and be able to apply that in the best form. This is the hikmah. And of course, as we see in the ayahs and the hadith, this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He blesses whoever he wants with this hikmah. 
Just like the, uh, we learn in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He gave Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam hikmah. It reminds me once Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salatu was salam had to make a judgment between two women who said that both of them they were carrying a child and they were claiming that this is my child. Each of them is claiming that this is my, chi- my child. Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salatu was salam when he asked them the whole situation they explained that we were out in the jungle and both of them we had our infants with us. And a wolf came and took one of our children and went away with it. So now both of them are arguing that whose child was taken away. The mother really knows. And even both of these know. But the one who lost the child, she would like to have a child. Dawood alayhi salatu was salam had no way of knowing now whose child would be this. So he gave the judgment that give it to the older of the two ladies that came for the judgment. As they walked out, Sulaiman alayhi salam who was still young, he asked them, what was the decision of my father about this? And they told him. He said, no, no, let's go back. And then he says to his father, the best way will be that we tell them. And now he's giving, he's issuing the ruling here. He says, we are going to cut the child into two pieces and each of you take one piece. So the older one says, the older lady says, yes, I'm ready for it. The younger one says, no, no, just give her the child. He says, this child belongs to the younger one. The mother does not want to see her child being getting cut. And the other one feels, if I lost mine, let her lost her too. يُؤْتِلْ حِكْمَةً مَنْ He gives the wisdom to whomever he likes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also tells us about Luqman, that he was Hakim. In fact, there is ayah in Qur'an that says about Luqman uh, al-Hakim, that we blessed him with hikmah. Just one, as we talked about one thing about uh, Sulaiman alayhi salam, let's just have one example of Luqman al-Hakim. Initially he was a slave from one of the African countries. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with a lot of knowledge, a lot of hikmah and wisdom. His master who owned him, he used to always gamble. And as he's gambling and gambling, one of these days, he lost his own wife and children and his home, everything. Gambling is something that really, you see people give up a lot of things for it. So the debate was, the loser now, because he has nothing now, so the loser either will have to drink the water of a river that was there. Drink the whole water from this river, or give the other person your wife, your children, and your house. So his master comes back, he after lo- he lost, he came back, and he knows that he has to give up everything now, he has no choice. So Luqman, which was, who was his slave, he asked him, I see that you are very worried. Something happened. He says, as normally people will look at those type of people, just be quiet, you know, you have nothing to do with it. Mind your own business, do your own work. After some time he approaches him again, you know, I see that you are having some worries, and I have never seen you in this type of situation before. So, I may be able to help you with something. Again, he rejects him. No, no, go ahead, do your own work. He doesn't feel that this person can do anything for me. But Luqman, he wants to help his master. So the third time he approaches him, he says, please, just tell me what's the situation. And then if I can't do nothing, you won't lose nothing. So the master tells him the whole thing. He says, there is a very easy solution to this. You are not going to lose nothing. Don't worry about anything. He says, what do you mean? There is no solution. Do you think I can drink the water? That's the only choice. He says, that's fine. You can do that. No, no, I can't do this. He says, I'll tell you how to do it. 
So he says, go and tell the other person, I'm willing to drink the water, but I'll drink the water only that is in this river at this time. I'm not going to drink the water that keeps on coming into it. So stop the water from getting into it. And then I'll start drinking this water. And he has no way of stopping the water from coming there. So if he has no way of stopping the water from coming there, then he cannot fulfill the condition and then you won't have to fulfill your condition. Condition is you just drink this one. You don't have to drink every water that keeps on coming into it. It's not going to end. So he was very happy. He goes back and he tells that person, okay, I'm willing to drink that water. He said, okay. He said, but stop the other water from getting in there. He has no way. So you do that, I'll drink the water. If you can't do it, I can't help you with it. So, at this time he didn't lose anything, but he set Luqman free. He let him go. So, hikmah. يُعْتِلْ حِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ And we know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about Ali radiyallahu anhu that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have blessed Ali radiyallahu anhu with hikmah, with wisdom. With a lot of hikmah. Really, subhanallah, if you start looking at the stories of Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu anhu in his hikmah, in his wisdom, there are so many, there are so many, and at this time, I'm just while I'm saying so many, I'm trying to decide which of those to mention, if I have to mention one. And believe me, they're just, you can say they're fighting here. I mean, it's so difficult to even choose one out of these. Let's just go ahead with one of them. Two people came to Ali radiallahu anhu. They have a dispute about a situation that they got into. And that was, both of them were sitting and eating some bread. One person had five bread, the other person had three bread. They are sitting and eating it. A person comes to join them, and he eats, he shares the food with them. When that person left, he hands over eight dollars, you can say, eight dinar according to the time, eight dollars to these people, and he says, take this, and share it among yourselves. So they take it. Now, the person with the five bread, he keeps the five dollars, and he says to his friend that, you know, you had three bread, so here you take the money of your three bread. He says, no, I'm not going to accept that. We don't know how much of your bread he ate and how much of my bread did he eat. So we should, we should distribute this equally between our souls. He says, no, this is not fair. I had five bread, you had only three bread. And here, one dollar per bread for each of us. That's very fair. But the other person feels, no, this is not justice. So they go to Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu anhu says to this person who had three bread, and his friend is offering him three dollars, he says to him, you know, it's in your favor, you take the three dollars. He says, no, I want justice. Okay, you want justice? Give me the money. They give him the money. Now Ali radiallahu anhu says to these people, now you have to accept the judgment because you came to me, I'm going to distribute the money as per justice now. Exactly as each person deserves. So he gives one dollar to this person who had seven, who had three bread, and seven dollars to the person who had five bread. And he says, "You are looking for justice. This is justice." So now, of course, as normally people nowadays also, when they don't understand the Sharia, or you know, this is Deen, what is justice? And there is no justice in Deen. It's because of the limited understanding. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala have closed all the doors of Hikmah. The person doesn't even pray a single prayer in the jama'ah. So 40 days, then the door will open. Now this person is dead, complaining that where is the justice? Is This is the justice of deen. You give me for three bread, you give me one dollar. For five bread, you give him seven dollars. Ali radiallahu says yes. This is exactly what it is. And the reason for that is three people eating. Eight bread all together. Now divide eight into three, because each bread, you can say that, was shared by three people. So divide eight into three. What's the total? 
What does it come to? 24. 24. No, no, not divided. Multiply. Uh, multiply. Okay. 24. Now, you be with me, young boy, <laughs> so that you take it back to your school. Now, there are three people, 24 pieces. Three people eating from these 24 pieces. How much each person is going to eat? Eight pieces, isn't it? Each person is going to eat eight pieces. Three bread were divided into three pieces, each bread into three pieces. So how much, how many pieces do you get from three bread? You get nine pieces. You got, he says to this man, you ate eight pieces from the nine pieces of your own, and the other man ate only one piece from yours. Five bread he had, and five times three, fifteen. You ate, he ate eight pieces of his own bread, seven pieces were left. Who ate them? The other man ate them. Got it? So the other person got eight pieces, seven pieces from this man who had five bread, and he got only one piece from you, because each person is getting out of 24 pieces that are of bread that are there, each person is eating eight pieces. You had three bread, from three bread you had nine pieces. He got only one piece from you, he got seven pieces from your friend. So your friend gets uh, seven dollars for the seven pieces that he gave that man, and you get one dollar for one piece that you gave that man. You ate the rest of your pieces. Hikmah. And now we think which university he was graduated from. <laughs> and some of his really, this was one of the, this wasn't the most difficult judgment of Ali radiallahu anhu that he just issues right there. This wasn't the most difficult one. There are some that if we even start talking about them, we will not be able to understand it for some time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed people with hikmah, with wisdom. And this is really, He opens the doors of the wisdom as a gift. This is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, nowadays you know what this hikmah means? When we talk about sharia, we say, you know, you should have hikmah. Which means, find a way of not following it. When you have to, when you go somewhere, people are doing haram. You know, you have hikmah, go and join them. Do all of that haram. Do you, you have a lot of hikmah. If you don't do that, everyone is going to come. A lot of time it happens to me too. When you go somewhere, there is something haram, you stay away from it. People will try to come and explain to you, you know. You use your hikmah, you come there, people will understand. Then you can sit and talk to people. Is this is the only occasion that we can sit and talk to people? That you go and commit some haram and then you talk to people? Why do you have to drink with those who are drinking as part of your hikmah? Why do you have to dance with those who are dancing as part of your hikmah? So hikmah really is used for a totally opposite meaning than what sharia is using it for. Sharia is using it for applying the sharia in the best way and is being used for rejecting it in a very nice way, where you will be considered good imam, good sheikh, good scholar, good Muslim, everything good, because you used your hikmah in rejecting the sharia. This is, if you look at it, normally, always, always, the word hikmah when it's being used, this is where it's used. When parents are trying to explain to their children not to follow deen, they will use the word hikmah. You know, you need to use hikmah. You don't pray in front of these children. You don't pray at your school. Come back home. Miss the salah. Hikmah. So, everywhere where a pe people will be teaching others to reject some of the orders of deen, they will start using the word hikmah for it. And of course, this is totally opposite than what Sharia is teaching us, the hikmah to be. But very quickly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his attribute is Al-Hakim in this sense. Who can get to the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who can get to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And according to his hikmah, according to his wisdom, he gave us the sharia. He gave us this deen. Many times we are not able to understand the reasoning behind these orders of the sharia. 
It's because our limited understanding, we cannot. We cannot understand the hikmah of Allah. So when a time comes when a person is not able to understand the hikmah of Allah, we should admit to our shortcomings and our limited understanding and just say, Allah is Hakim. If he says two raka'ah for fajr, I'm not going to argue why not three raka'ahs for fajr. If he says three for maghrib, I will accept them and I won't say why not two for maghrib. Because this is his hikmah, I cannot understand it. I have, we have our limitations to the hikmah, to our understanding, to our wisdom. So the real hikmah is that when we, when our mind gives up, our understanding gives up, then you follow the one who is more hakim, more wise than you are. This is the real hikmah. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, the real knowledge is when you don't know, you say, I don't know. This is the real knowledge. And the real hikmah is when you don't, when you don't know, when you cannot understand it, you follow the one who has a better understanding than yours. And this is really the hikmah. This is the real wisdom that you did not give up the hikmah at that level of your understanding. You went beyond your understanding of hikmah and followed more better understanding. So, this is what the whole sharia is. is the, the whole sharia is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is the wisdom, knowledge that came as a wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, if this is the highest source of wisdom that we have, then the best wisdom is to follow the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Wa lisa'il al-muslimin wa al-muslimat. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. If anyone has a question. The question is about hikmah for non-Muslims. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives knowledge, understanding, wisdom to even non-Muslims. And there is wisdom in their field. But of course, the highest wisdom is the wisdom of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is the real hikmah that has been given to human beings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the highest level of it, but there is another hikmah also there that is, of course, Muslims, non-Muslims, everyone gets it in other fields of the life. The hikmah has nothing, if a person has knowledge, wisdom, understanding, that has nothing to do with a person getting forgiveness or going to the Jannah. That depends on Iman. Just as the brother asked this question, one of the very interesting replies of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu and his hikmah and wisdom came to my mind that once a person asked him about qadr, destiny, that if everything is predestined, how much choice do we have? So he tried to explain to him in a nice way and the person is going back and forth, no, he this objection, that objection, so he says to him, okay. Now we realize that this person needs a better one. So he says to him, lift, while you're standing, lift one of your legs. So he lifts his leg up. He says, now pick up the other leg. He says, I can't. Ali radiallahu anhu says to him, this is how much choice you have, this is how much you're forced. This is qada and this is qadr. That to a certain extent you have your choice, and to a certain extent you just follow that. 